Hi, everybody. Our conversation today involves a legal case between a human rights environmental activist lawyer named Stephen Donziger and the oil giant Chevron. It's a story that began early in the 1960s when then Texaco created what has been called an Amazon Chernobyl. What they did was that they dumped 16 billion gallons of wastewater into rivers and pits. They had had an agreement with the Ecuadorian government that allowed them to drill for oil. And they applied none of the protections, the environmental protections, that were made legal in the United States. What this has done is created the largest environmental oil disaster anywhere in the world. And yet you might not have heard about it because it has been underreported and somehow the story has been suppressed. It has been suppressed because when Stephen Donziger and other environmental lawyers came to the aid and to the defense of the indigenous tribes in Ecuador who have suffered as they have suffered because of this horrible environmental disaster, what ultimately happened was that Chevron came against them. And Chevron is now doing everything they can and have been doing so to destroy the career of this man in order to have a chilling effect on the environmental movement, on any journalists, any activists, or any lawyers who in any way will try to defend the people of Latin America or anywhere else for that matter, who have been harmed by the activities of these oil companies. The story is important. My first guest today is Paul Paz Emino, who is the associate director of Amazon Watch. These were his words. It should be nothing short of terrifying for any activist challenging corporate power and the oil industry in the United States. Chevron has made it clear there is no amount of money that's too much to spend on this case. They will stop at nothing. They will stop at nothing, not to clean up the disaster, but instead to demonize and destroy anyone who tries to hold them accountable. Hi, my first guest today is Paul Pazimino, and he's the associate director of Amazon Watch. And I have invited Paul to give us a kind of thumbnail sketch, what has happened here. Paul, first of all, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You know, Paul, um, many people know the story of Stephen Donziger and this drama with Chevron, but many people don't. And I think it's such an important story. Um, it's a very painful one, but it in many ways embodies some of the worst dysfunctions of how uh, corporate America operates these days and has been operating for a long time. And in addition, of course, the story goes on to show uh, how conspiratorial our own uh, criminal justice system is sometimes with those forces. So um, would you please give us um, a sketch of what happened here, going all the way back to the 1960s and Texaco. Uh, I'd really appreciate it. So just uh, tell everybody what happened here. Sure, absolutely. It, it's kind of still shocking to me, uh, working on this case now with Amazon Watch for over 13 years, how many people don't know the history of the largest oil-related catastrophe uh, in the world. And Texaco was the first company to drill for oil in the Amazon, setting a terrible precedent. The company went to Ecuador in the 60s, a very U.S. and oil-friendly government, basically gave them permission to do whatever they wanted. And they deliberately poisoned the drinking water of tens of thousands of people over the course of decades because they could get away with it. So they drilled for oil in the Amazon, the northern Ecuadorian Amazon, and Texaco created a disaster by deliberately dumping drilling water. So when you drill for crude oil, first you extract heavy waters laced with chemicals, carcinogens, horrible things. The practice in the United States by law had been for many years that those waters need to be contained in a tank and then re-injected into the earth. But there was no such law at Ecuador at the time because no one had operated there yet. So Texaco decided that they could save about $3 a barrel by dumping this toxic waste into the Amazon. They dug pits in the earth. They didn't even line them with anything. They put a system of gooseneck pipes to allow the rain from, obviously we're talking about the rainforest, the rain would go into these pits and then leach out into the drinking water of indigenous communities and other people through almost a thousand pits of toxic waste. And then when their consortium ended in the 90s, Texaco left they left almost a thousand of these pits. They signed a corrupt deal with the government of Ecuador to spend $40,000 to essentially push dirt over a portion of those pits, washed their hands of it, said they were done. 
and never went back. Now, the indigenous communities and other farmer communities sued Texaco in New York. And Texaco spent almost a decade arguing that New York was not the proper venue, that this case should be moved to Ecuador, and that if they did move it there, they would honor any decision that Ecuadorian courts came up with. At the time, the Ecuadorian government was still incredibly oil friendly. So they thought that they could essentially make this case go away. Well, after 10 years of fighting in New York, indigenous communities were forced to go back to Ecuador. At that point, Chevron merged with Texaco, became the same company, and assumed all of its liabilities. And then on day one of the trial in Ecuador, they stood up and said, we shouldn't be here. We never operated here. We don't observe the justice of this system. And we, we reject this case. Now, of course, they had to stay there. And then, of course, over the course of almost another decade, Chevron was found liable with thousands of samples of toxic contamination submitted by Chevron's own scientists. They were found liable for $9.5 billion in 2011. It's the largest case in the history of Ecuador. And it was the first time indigenous and farmer communities successfully sued an oil company on their own and won. And then, of course, what Chevron did from that point forward was say, we're not going to respect this, even though they had said they would in New York. We're not going to pay. We pulled our assets out. And then this is what's scary for everybody else looking at this case. They turned around and sued the very people that they had poisoned and their lawyers and dragged everyone else into the case that they could environmental organizations, journalists, bloggers, shareholders, and launched a massive scorched earth retaliation campaign funded by almost billions of dollars, 60 law firms. And they tried to say Chevron was the victim. The whole case was a conspiracy and they should never have to clean up. And the problem is the government of Ecuador's. Now they've, during the course of this, they have specifically targeted Stephen Donzinger, the lead lawyer in this case. And they, they essentially have shown that because they knew they couldn't win on the merits, and in fact, when the contamination was looked at, they lost, they've tried to do everything they could to not talk about what happened in Ecuador and make this a case about corruption and try to build a narrative that it's a greedy New York lawyer who's just trying to get rich. Meanwhile, the contamination and the evidence of their acts remains in Ecuador to this day, still poisoning the drinking water of these people to this very day. It's there for everyone to see. And the tragedy of this is that Chevron has been able to drag it out for almost 25 years while people continue to suffer at their contamination. Contamination, which remember they admitted to deliberately creating in the first place. They don't deny that they dumped this. They don't deny that they operated. They simply say, we don't want to be the ones to pay to clean it up and somebody else should do it. There are so many layers um, uh, uh, to this story, including the fact that they felt they could get away with it because it was poor indigenous tribes in Latin America. Um, during the first uh, presidential debate, I remember uh, turning around and, and saying, well, I haven't heard you guys say anything about American po foreign policy in Latin America. And it was kind of fun where I stood watching two U.S. senators kind of jump and look at each other like, do you believe she said that? And I think <laughs> I think that there is more and more of a consciousness about the the terrible, terrible uh, wrongs that have been done in the name of uh, American corporations uh, and by American corporations, particularly in Latin America, that people are awakening, to, awakening up to. Now, when you talk about the, the horrible consequences, one has to do, of course, with the water and one has to do with the health of the people. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah. I mean, there's... Imagine having carcinogens put into your drinking water for decades, children born with birth defects, spontaneous miscarriages, over a thousand people have died of cancer. Scientific records show that the level of cancer, the rate of cancer in this region is so much higher than any other part of Ecuador. And we're talking about what used to be pristine Amazon rainforest. In fact, this is not far from the most biodiverse part of the entire Amazon, Yasuni National Park. Ecuador is a treasure of beauty, indigenous communities, and biodiversity. And the destruction that has been wrecked upon the people live there has devastated and actually wiped out two entire indigenous ethnicities. The ones that remain are coping with the fallout of this and other communities are looking at the devastation there and trying to prevent 
oil drilling in their area. It's, it's very similar to what happened in Peru. Occidental Petroleum did something similar there. Amazon Watch has been working with communities in all of these areas to prevent new oil companies from coming in and to push for actual um, accountability for these cases. And you're very, very right that U.S. companies and the approach of Chevron has been so laced with environmental racism it's shocking. They have dismissed the Ecuadorian people. They have dismissed their entire country. Every judge has been called corrupt. The, the U.S. judge that works with Chevron, and, and I say worked with because he was clearly biased on behalf of this U.S. oil company, called the Ecuadorian so-called plaintiffs and refused to allow the evidence of Chevron's contamination to even be uttered in his courtroom. And the shock there is that, of course, the justice in this actual case is not something that Chevron is interested in seeing done. And that's what's really scary for the climate movement, for environmental justice, for those fighting environmental racism, because when an oil company can orchestrate the, the situation in such a way that the actual acts of destruction aren't part of the judicial proceedings, they can again essentially get away with anything. And that's what they've done in the Ecuadorian case. And of course, this is more than just about environmentalism. This is about fascism. When you have a criminal justice system that works simply as a handmaiden uh, to corporate power, that's the that there's your definition of fascism right there. And of course, right now in the United States, the issue of environmental justice, people are beginning to recognize issues of environmental justice with places such as Flint. But what people are recognizing now is that this started in other countries a long time before um, we started seeing these kinds of things here, or at least recognizing that these kinds of things were happening here. Now, Stephen Donziger, as you said, was the lead lawyer all the way back then. When did he, do you know when he started? I'll ask him this, but when did he start working with the Ecuadorian? In the early 90s, uh, when Texaco first left, he went to Ecuador. I believe he was a journalist in Latin America. And so he, he's been involved since the beginning of the Texaco lawsuit in New York. So um, uh, uh, Chevron has about a $228 billion uh, market capitalization. They could easily go clean up this thing. And they have spent $2 billion on it. So you said the original the original um, uh, judgment was for $18 billion. That got reduced to $9.5 billion. Chevron said, we're not going to pay. But Chevron has paid $2 billion just to demonize Stephen Donziger and the environmentalist movement. Is that correct? Yes. And their lawyers, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, have basically built an entire entire legacy of their legal operation on the idea that they can defend and protect corporations like Chevron in this particular kind of situation. In fact, when they launched their retaliatory suit, the Americans for tort reform said, this is a new playbook to go after corporate gadflies. So this is a corporate mechanism to shut down people who are trying to hold them to account. And Chevron orchestrated it in such a way that they could terrorize anybody who was working on this case. I'm talking about one person who wrote one blog one time receiving a subpoena from a federal judge that they have to turn over all of their communications to Chevron. Imagine what journalist is going to want to touch this case if they know that they're going to have everything that they've written seized and handed over to an oil company with a reputation like Chevron? They did it to Amazon Watch. They tried to do it to Rainforest Action Network, many other NGOs, and concerned shareholders. So people within Chevron who are trying to move the company in the right direction, have it be accountable for its acts. They are shut down and threatened as well. Chevron has spared no expense to go after whoever is critical about them in this case. And the U.S. judicial system has basically given them the free reign to do that, especially through this Judge Kaplan, federal judge in the Southern District of New York. And they have said that they will pay and stay with it as long as they need to until hell freezes over, they say. But I'm curious about this. How much would it have just cost them to clean this up? Yeah. Well, one scary thing is that we found uh, a memo from Texaco saying that the, if they had spent $4 million, they could have at least lined the pits that they created so that the chemicals wouldn't go directly into the groundwater. And they determined that that was too much money to spend. Right. So they see anything like that as a slippery slope. So their position is no accountability. No accountability. Exactly. They they knew what they were doing from the very outset. And we have interviewed former employees for Texaco who said, you, we were told to just spill this stuff into the drinking water. And we felt terrible because we knew that these communities were living off it. But if we didn't do what we were told, we would be fired. Texaco knew what they were doing. 
You know, there's so many things when you look at uh, issues of racism here in the United States. There's a lot of atoning going on. A lot of companies saying, we realize that this company did things decades ago that were wrong, and we want to make it right now. That's what we need to develop. That's what we need to develop is the consciousness where a company like Chevron would say, we understand that what Texaco did in the 1960s was wrong. We have inherited their liabilities as well as their assets through this merger, and we're going to make it right now. And I think that, that the closest we can get to making that happen is our own recognition of the story, understanding the story, and sharing it with people. Because there's one particular person, namely Stephen Donzik, who's suffering terribly. His family is suffering terribly as a result of this. They they are out to destroy him. They're out to destroy his career. He has been in uh, under house arrest for something like 13 months. And I will, of course, be asking him, uh, asking him more about his own experience. But let me just, before I let you go, and thank you so much for giving us this overview. Um, is the is, when you were just talking about the intimidation uh, that that Chevron uh, perpetrates and undertakes against anybody who stands up for Stephen? Is that why there's not more? I know there is you, of course, and a few individuals and organizations, but for the most part, the environmentalist movement in the United States is shockingly quiet about this. Is that why? Well, I, the funny thing is. Sierra Club, Greenpeace, Amnesty, Global Witness, all these organizations have come out and condemned Chevron's behavior. Not only is Texaco in the original contamination, but in the retaliatory attacks. But nobody apart from Amazon Watch has consistently stayed as a campaigning environmental organization from day one up until now. And I I can't tell you the reason why, but I can tell you that the coverage in the media has been suppressed by Chevron and their lawyers. And I know for a fact, because reporters have told me, this story is being crushed by my editor. There's a smear campaign against you. Chevron's lawyers are calling our lawyers. 60 Minutes pulled the story that they did in 2009 down. So they may be exerting, and I know they have tried to go after Amazon Watch's donors and scare them away from supporting us. So who's to say they haven't done the same thing with large organizations that receive foundation grants from large foundations, for example, that they have spared, I'm I'm not exaggerating, no expense to try to shut down anybody that comes after them on this. And that could make a lot of people vulnerable because Chevron is the third largest corporation in the United States and the, the largest in California. The amount of power and pressure that they have on our judicial system, on our politics, is staggering. We went from a time when um, the same kinds of articles that would get journalists um, uh, Pulitzer Prizes turned into articles that they probably couldn't even get written, and if they did, would probably get them fired. A very famous example has to do with Chiquita Bananas and how they were actually yeah. the company was actually hiring death squads to work against yes. their work. Columbia. Instead, uh huh. Instead, they turned it against uh, the reporter and even sued the reporter because there had been some um, some transgression with a cell phone. And and when I read these stories, what I see over and over and over again is how much of this is in Latin America. Uh, and have read, of course, John Perkins' book about the secret uh, American empire down there. I think this is a big awakening going on uh, right now. And uh, I thank you very, very much for explaining the case to us. And uh, I know I had heard, actually, of a New York Times article that supposedly was going to be written and then uh, wasn't. And I've had my own experience. So I, I have a um, some personal sense of how, how the... Um, political media industrial complex works to determine the narrative uh, that is convenient for them. And a large, uh, when it comes to the media and when it comes to politics, both what's nar- what the narrative that is convenient for them has to do with their own money and their own power. Um, when you're talking about something like Chevron, you're not only talking about uh, how they advertise in these media outlets, but also, of course, their donations to political uh, figures. Yeah. And thank you so much for paying attention to this and, and spreading the word. It's so critical, especially now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, uh, anytime that you're working on something that you feel uh, it, I might be helpful to you in getting the word out, please don't hesitate. Um, uh, I have great respect for people such as yourself. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Likewise. Take care. Hey, Stephen, thank you very much for joining me for this conversation. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be invited. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I see that you were raised in Florida and that one of your early activist experiences had to do with Cesar Chavez and the lettuce boycott. And that's true of my childhood as well. My brother even worked for Cesar Chavez down in McAllen, Texas. And of course, none of us could eat grapes for a long time. Uh, So it was interesting for me to to read about your background, Uh, your Harvard-educated law. But before 
before you went to Harvard, you you lived as a journalist down in uh, was it in Ecuador or somewhere else in Latin America? No, it was in it was in Nicaragua um, uh-huh. during the Contra War between the Sandinistas and the Contras. Those of us old enough remember in the, when the during the first Reagan administration. So, I reported from Managua and you know really a lot many parts of Central America during that time. And then when did you first find out about what was going on in Ecuador and uh, the Texaco dump? You know, my experience as a reporter in in Central America, just I had a lot of interest in Latin America. So when I got out of law school, um, I had an opportunity to travel to Ecuador with some other lawyers who had heard about this awful pollution problem um, to really investigate it and to explore the possibility of trying to do something about it for the people who live there. So I first went to Ecuador in April of 1993, of course, having no idea in the world that I would get so heavily involved and that my work would you know, be focused on this for so many years. But on that first trip, it was a really an astounding trip in many respects. I mean, one is I saw massive, massive pollution. I couldn't believe my eyes that any company, much less an American company, could go into another country and do what at that time Texaco had done. And, you know, I, I left I left Ecuador saying, you know, I got to be involved and, you know, we can't turn our backs on these people. And here I am over 25 years later, you know, after we won really, I think the, one of the most important environmental judgments in history. Um, and I'm now targeted with the most, probably the most ferocious corporate counterattack in history. Um, but all in all, it's it's certainly been an interesting experience. Well, it's, uh, it says a lot for your character that you can define it that way. I've heard you call yourself a corporate political prisoner. And one of the reasons your story is so important is because that's exactly what you are. And there is a pattern here. You are one of the most egregious examples of this pattern. But the pattern itself is terrifying for American democracy as well as uh, for what it has done to your life and, of course, for what all of this did to the life of the indigenous people down in Ecuador. So in the 1990s, when you as a young environmental lawyer said, I'm going to take on Chevron, do did you have any idea in your mind that the system of justice that you had been educated in, you were a Harvard-educated lawyer, did, you have, did it ever occur to you in the 1990s that they might come after you personally, Stephen? No. Okay. What happened? I want to hear your story. I want to hear what the trajectory was that led Chevron. Here, Chevron has spent $2 billion, but instead of spending their money on any kind of environmental cleanup, they've done it, they've spent their money to demonize you in order to have this chilling effect so that no environmental activists, lawyers, journalists, et cetera, would be in any way questioning their authority as an American oil giant. Is that correct? That is, it's a power game for them. In other words, one thing I, I kind of learned, Marianne, at the beginning, so you get out of law school and you're like, oh, you, you, know, you can accomplish things through the law. You can go to court to obtain justice. And, you know, it is true to some degree, mostly on individual kinds of cases. But when you, I've quickly learned when you take on a corporation that it has so much power, and whose business model is fundamentally based on violence, meaning the violent act of extracting resources, oil from deep within the ground, in this case, indigenous territory, they they have so much money and power and they fight so hard that even a little peep of, of some group of people holding them accountable often prompts massive litigation, personal demonization, and counterattacks. And I, I learned pretty quickly that Chevron kind of, we looked at the legal system differently. You know, I looked at the legal system as a lawyer, as a place my clients could go to maybe attain, obtain justice. Chevron kind of looked at the legal system as just one little piece on the ch- a much larger chessboard of a power game. Like Chevron played at a governmental level. They, you know, manipulate governments, oil companies pay off government officials. Um, it, what goes on in court is something they feel they they sort of feel like they can control to the extent they can, and they can overwhelm judges and courts with resources and lawyers. And they they use courts as another way to try to intimidate. Whereas we saw courts as a place we could get justice. And that dynamic, that fundamental difference, has lasted to this day. I mean, it's I think they abuse their power. And I think they abuse court systems and it's evidenced by, you know, what they're doing to me today and really what they're doing to me is a way for them to get at the real problem, 
which is the indigenous peoples in the Amazon and the rural communities in the Amazon, who literally are dying off because of pollution that Texaco, now Chevron, deliberately dumped over a period of 25 plus years in a systematic way, 4 million gallons a day, that has poisoned this entire ecosystem that covers 1,500 square plus miles in which thousands of people live and with no recourse other than to drink contaminated water, breathe contaminated air, eat contaminated food. And what's happened over all these years is really a humanitarian catastrophe has been created. The world knows very little about it, but rather than deal with it, you know, they did lose the case. We won the case. They immediately threatened the indigenous peoples with a lifetime of litigation unless they quit. Um, and they refuse to pay. And they pay lawyers massive sums of money. I mean, they've hired 60 law firms, 2,000 lawyers to deal with this, really, and, and attack me. And they attack me as a foil, you know, they, to distract attention from their own criminality and their own wrongdoing and their own responsibility. And they do this to me and to the Ecuadorians because we have been very successful. There's hundreds of other examples of this where Chevron and the other oil majors have done this effectively such that you never hear about the case, like they never get off the ground. So this is an unusual one because we actually got it off the ground. We sustained it. We raised money. We, had a, we have and still have a great international coalition of lawyers and adv- advocates and community leaders, and it's still going. So you're seeing things in response to that that the world has never seen before because no case has ever gotten quite as far as ours. Okay, there is so much to discuss here. First of all, you know, a lot of people would hear your story and say, well, surely this can't happen. It's wrong. It should be illegal. You know, I grew up, my father was an immigration lawyer. My brother's an immigration lawyer. I grew up, my, you know, among left-wing lawyers. And there was this David and Goliath idea. My father always said law can be a weapon and you use it as a weapon. And David, you know, David to Goliath. And what you're talking about here is a shift that occurred in the United States. And maybe it had been there before, but not nothing like uh, has now unfolded over the last few decades, which is, yeah, an individual might be able to defeat an unjust individual. That's what I'm hearing you say, right? An an individual might still be able to use uh, the law in such a way that they get justice when they have been, uh, when something, uh, injustice has been perpetrated by an individual. But what you're saying is that these corporations are so huge and so powerful and have such financial power, not only... uh, and the criminal justice system, the government itself, uh, the media, that what you're saying is that to look to the legal system for redress when the injustice done towards you has been a huge financial institution or corporation, don't even think about it. And that a case like yours shows not only will you lose, they might come after you because they want everybody to to know that will not be tolerated. Am I correct? You are, you are largely correct. I mean, basically, they're trying to come after me not only to protect Chevron and the Chevrons of the world, but to send a message of intimidation, is right. my view, to anyone who would even think about doing this work. I mean, think about all the young lawyers in the top law schools and any law school in America. It's like, wow, I'd love to get into environmental justice. I mean, this is one of the most, if not the most pressing issues of the day, right? Climate change, survival of the planet. So the law obviously is a place that, you know, you know, is a forum where these problems can be addressed and potentially solved. And that's why you see all these municipalities around the United States suing the fossil fuel companies now for damage caused by climate change. Right. You know, so I'll tie it to this. I mean, you know, what we're watching now in the United States, first of all, I think there's a great underappreciation by environmental activists and political thinkers about the importance of courts to achieving social justice aims, you know, because right. you can do lots of things politically. And then as we're watching now with the rushing through of the new Supreme Court nominee, Amy right. Coney Barrett, like the corporate right is, has their eye on the one unelected branch of our government. And they plan to use the Supreme Court and the federal courts more generally to block these types of changes that our elected leaders are going to start implementing more and more, particularly if we see a change of government. So you have to keep your eye on the courts. I, I think the attack on me 
is a warning sign as to how far they are willing to go if they feel they can get away with it. Because what's happened to me has never happened to a lawyer before in the history of the United States. And it's, it's quite frightening. I mean, I could talk about details, but, you know, but I'm want, locked up in my home right now. Right. And I want to hear, I want people to know what some of these details are about your house arrest, about your disbarment, about the money that they have spent to smear you, to demonize you. I think people do need to know. So have at it. Let us know what's happened to you. How have they come after you? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, Chevron has had a, a kind of a graduated plan of attack. You know, first they threatened me and they thought I could maybe go away. But their goal is to get me to quit working on the case and disappear. Um, and when that doesn't work, they go to a new level and then from there to an, the next level. And ultimately what's happened is, I mean, they sued me civilly for $60 billion, the highest potential liability in U.S. history. And I'm just a guy living with my wife and 14-year-old. You don't have $60 billion lying around, Stephen? <laughs> Try coming home to your spouse, you know, when you say, hey, how did you do <laughs> it? And you say, well, I just got sued for how much? It's $60 billion. I mean, you have to laugh. You know, I mean, I mean if it was a reasonable number, you'd be like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? But, like, it was so absurd. And that I, a human rights lawyer, get sued for the most money of any, any individual in U.S. history. But they're fundamentally cowards deep down, in my opinion. So they dropped all the money damages claims on the eve of this retaliation trial. That was held before a judge here in New York who was a former tobacco lawyer who denied me a jury, let Chevron put in what I believe is false evidence. They paid a guy a bunch of money to come in and claim I bribed the judge in Ecuador. And it didn't happen. There was no corroborating evidence. The, The witness later admitted he had lied, but the judge still found that I had bribed the judge in Ecuador. So that became a judicial fact. And then post trial, they tried to attack me financially you know, as we were litigating the case in other countries. Um, and they got the, this judge, who, I, again, I think is very biased against me, to impose literally millions and millions of dollars of fines on me and court costs, ordering me to repay Chevron for their legal fees. They make $250 billion a year, and I make virtually no money. You know, so they hit me financially. And then based on his decision, which has been contradicted by 29 appellate judges and six appellate courts in Ecuador and Canada, he asked for me to be disbarred. And they eventually, this, the New York bar authorities disbarred me without even giving me a hearing to challenge his evidence. It's completely inappropriate. I'm appealing it. Um, and then on top of that, when I kept working, he created like a pincer move. And he said, you got to turn your computer and cell phone over to Chevron, which violates my own ethical no, lawyer. obligations yeah. to my clients, to myself, right. to other lawyers. And when I appealed that, I didn't say I'm not going to do it. I said, I need to get appellate review of this before I do it, because this seems brazenly illegal. And if I do it, the damage it will cause will never be able right. to be remediated if I went right. on appeal. Right. And that's actually a normal thing for a lawyer to do in the United States is, is you can get a direct appeal by going into what's called voluntary civil contempt. And I asked him to do that so I could get an appeal. And he did hold me in contempt. I appealed. And he then charged me criminally with the same conduct and had me locked up 15 months ago. He appointed another judge who's a member of the Federalist Society, which, you know, is a whole thing with Corporatist you know, the, right the, wing. The, the, the organization to try yep. to get right wingers on the judiciary. She, right. Chevron's Where a major donor succeeding? of that. And she locked me up. I'm, you know, there's never been a lawyer in U.S. history who's ever been held pre-trial for even a day on a criminal contempt charge. I'm right, the first so one in 15 bit, months. I, I want everybody to understand, that means house arrest. You've been under house arrest. Yeah, I've been in house arrest. I have an ankle bracelet With on my With an ankle. ankle bracelet. So that means they monitor me 24-7 via GPS. Um, the bracelet does not come off. It's, it's like a garage door opener. I call it the black claw. I sleep with it. It talks to me sometimes when the battery goes low, like a recorded voice comes on. Um, I, I bathe with it. I eat with it. I ne- it never comes off. I can't run. Even even I, I do get out occasionally with permission of the court, but I can't exercise. I can't run, which I used to do. And it's it's extremely burdensome. Now, I keep it in perspective because there's a lot of human rights defenders around the world who or face far worse situations that's than right, me who get, right. who get murdered for doing this kind of that's work. That's right. That's right. Um, I, I don't want to, I'm not excusing what they're doing to me because I think it's wrong. 
Right. But I also try to keep it in perspective, and I'm hopeful, and I'm still very optimistic. Well, I think the issue for many of us who are Americans is we have recognized that terrible things like that happen in other countries. But we're going through this awakening about the things that happen here. And they're in game, Stephen. What do they ultimately want? They want you to go to prison, right? They do. They, they want me destroyed. Um, right. You know, they don't want me to have any credibility when this is over. They don't want right. me to be able to talk and have people listen to me. They don't want right. me to be able to write and have whatever I write published. They don't want me to be able to be a lawyer. They, want, they don't want me to be have the credibility to go into court or organize lawsuits or meet with clients. Now, part of their problem is the more they do this to me, you know, sort of the more people are beginning to realize how wrong it is. And, and ironically, as I've been under house arrest, I believe my credibility has actually increased, not right. decreased. So, right. you know, there is that dynamic in, in political action where when you overreach, um, you start to look bad. And I right. think we're in that area. And, you know, I'm facing this trial on November 4th where they're denying me a jury again. I'm facing prison. The judge wouldn't schedule it at a time my lawyers could come. The COVID pandemic makes calling witnesses. I have witnesses from Spain, Ecuador, Canada. They can't get here. They can't travel here. She still wants to hold the trial because deep down, she doesn't want me to be able to defend myself properly because I really do have a defense. So it's a preordained result, just like the other case was where I also did not get a jury. And it just blows my mind that the system, when you sort of work 20 plus years, you know, as a human rights lawyer to help people, it can then, you know, find you millions and millions of dollars, basically take all your money and ultimately put you in jail without even a jury. I mean, it's, They've really fought. They've really it's really fought. scary. So that you would and, not and, and be by able the way, it's happened not just because of Chevron. It's happened because these judges that you know are part of this new trend in our federal judiciary right. are the corporatists take fully over the involved US in pushing it. Mm-hmm. Right. They and don't the, want human rights lawyers doing this work, or if they do do it, they don't want it to be successful. And you know, in New York, where the federal courts, you know, I, I, I've lived here for many, many years. I mean, in the 1980s, it was different. I mean, human people were hopeful about human rights, and the Alien right. Tort Claims Act was a way right. foreign uh, victims of human rights could come to the United States, you know, and get results in court. Right. And you know, over the last 30 years, it's just gotten more and more hostile. The courts here toward foreigners who are victimized by U.S. corporations, you know, operating in other countries. I mean, it's, it's, by the way, it's totally different than Canadian courts, which are moving in the opposite direction. They're granting more and more rights to foreigners to sue Canadian companies in Canada where they have their assets. The United States is the opposite, and it's just a super hostile forum for victims of human rights in the federal judiciary. And it's unfortunate. And look, I've been working on this case 25 years and I've seen it in that period of time. Like at the beginning, we're like, hey, we can do this through the U.S. courts. And now we're like, wait a second. There's probably no more hostile a court system in the world to human rights of the sort of sophisticated countries um, than our own country, which is sad. I mean, but, you know, it's reflective also of what we see in the world with the current administration. I mean, you know this better than anybody having been a candidate. I mean, anti-human rights, anti-multilateral, anti-cooperation, completely inward looking and corrupt. I'm not saying that all that applies to courts, but it's just, it's just we have a bad dynamic in this country. And I think these judges who take the position that human rights law is not somehow not legit um, feel emboldened right now. Right. And Amy Barrett is certainly the epitome of all of that. Absolutely. I mean, people need to focus not only on, they need to focus on the the impact her ascension to the Supreme Court is going to have on the climate issue. It's going to be a disaster. uh, On many issues having to do with human uh, human rights. And of course, if if the president wins again, uh, his, uh, you know, the, the, power that he has already uh, wielded in uh, appointing very, very, very right-wing corporatist lawyers is already um, is already well-established. When I talked to you a few minutes ago and I said something about your case and I said, am I correct? You said you're largely correct. I want to make sure that I don't say anything here that's not totally correct. Did I say anything wrong? It was just the point that that I don't want to totally generalize about our courts, okay? Because you can, I, I'm a man of the rule of law and I right. am a lawyer, although they disbarred me. But, you know, I and you're appealing that. 
and I'm appealing that. I be, right. and I'm still I'm still a lawyer in the District right. of Columbia, which is another jurisdiction. But you know, I, I believe that the law um, is a place that you can go to get justice. And I don't want to say that the entire federal judiciary is what I've experienced. It's not. This is right. extreme. Right. And there are a lot of judges, many judges. I'd like to think most judges don't come out of this whole kind of corporatist, federalist society. Right. And they actually do try to do fair. But I will say that it's extremely hard in our federal courts to find, say, a human rights lawyer who's a judge, you know, or a former defense lawyer. Almost all the judges come out of the corporate world or the government, national security or prosecution worlds. Um, someone like Thurgood Marshall, you know, I don't think Thurgood Marshall ever in today's world will be appointed to the expect? Supreme Court. He's a civil rights lawyer. Exactly. When was the last time a civil rights lawyer was appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court? I mean, yeah, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you could say, but who since? Right. Absolutely. Well, I'm so glad we circle back to that because I know what you're saying is true and I never really felt or thought otherwise. So if I indicated otherwise, I'm so sorry and I'm so, so no, glad no, that no, I no, got no. corrected. No, 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 but you nailed it for the no, most part. No, but I get absolutely. what you're saying too. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I was... Um, very involved in a case in Michigan with a, a girl who was in prison who was given a 17 to 25 year prison sentence. Um, all she had done, she had been offered, she was 16 years old or 17 at the time. And she, her, her sister's boyfriend, I think had offered her $50 to drive the car in a marijuana sale. And she knew nothing else about anything else. Um, uh, a murder was committed. She was very, very unfairly uh, convicted. She had nothing to do with it. There was a forced uh, confession. It was so horrible. And it, it took quite a few years, but finally uh, Governor Granholm did commute her sentence. And what I saw was how many judges tried to come to her defense, how many judges wrote letters, how many judges said this is egregiously wrong. So I've seen that in, in, in many cases where the judges are pulling their hair out as much as anyone else is. And of course, with all those mandatory sentences, uh, you know, when all of that started happening and judges couldn't apply their own wisdom and their own judicial discretion anymore. So I do not see the individual judges as themselves the problem. So thank you very, very much for that. In an individual case of injustice, there's often a lot of compassion. Not always, and actually often not. But when it comes to really dealing with a, a multi-billion dollar judgment against a powerful U.S. company, it's a whole different ballgame. You meet That's a level of resistance that exactly. you don't meet in those other cases, is my experience. And what you've pointed out about your own uh, your own uh, judge and the Federalist Society and these, these, these the, you know, we talk about the intersectionality of poverty and, and, and uh, dysfunction. There's an intersectionality here between these corporatist forces and they, you know, we know all this now. We know about the dark money. We know about what's happened and it's been happening for decades. And here they get the judiciary. Here they get the think tanks. Here they get the uh, political figures. And it's, uh, uh, of course, it's all climax with this particular president and this particular election. But it's very important when people know about cases like yours, they see what actually happens to human beings. Not only the human beings, the indigenous tribes in the Ecuador who've had this horrible, uh, horrible thing perpetrated against them, not only what has happened to the earth, but also what happens in too many cases to people such as yourself who try to stand up for justice and try to push back. Now, I read that the maximum sentence in a case like yours would be six months in prison. Is that correct? Yeah, that's true. If you don't give a jury, the maximum is six months. Right. And you have a Zoom trial on November 4th, right? That's the schedule. But no jury, no jury, no jury, even though you have no tried very hard and, to get a jury trial. And I can't get my lawyer there because he can't do the case until December 7th. And we told the judge that in August. And, you know, she still scheduled it originally for Election Day when I think they thought nobody would be watching. Then she switched it to the day after Election Day. And knowing my lawyer, my lead lawyer can't get there. There's a massive amount of work. And, you know, she, I, I can't mount a defense properly. How can we help you, Stephen? Well, <laughs> thank you for asking. I mean, I, I want people to know about this first and foremost. So it's a pleasure and an honor to be on your podcast. Um, a great admiration, Marianne, for your own work and for your, you. your dignity and intelligence of which you presented yourself during the campaign. I really thank was you. impressed and, and just proud of you as a thank citizen so to much. sort of get up there on that stage and do what you did. Um, 
the way to really help me is to learn about the case, go to our website, which is makechevroncleanup.com. We work closely with Amazon Watch, Paul Poss, and have people sign up to our campaign. We've already signed up 15,000 people, more or less. And we ask people to take certain actions. And then the third thing is, if people are in a position to do so and believe in this, please, please, please contribute to my legal defense fund, which is the money there is held in trust in a really high level firm in Seattle called Friedman Rubin. And the money is used to pay legal expenses, travel expenses, and basic living expenses for me and my family. Because since I got locked up in my house, I can't earn a living. And they've taken, they've frozen my bank accounts. And, you know, that's a big part of a tax on people who dissent. I mean, you see this in Russia and Turkey and in these authoritarian societies where, you know, people like Putin and Erdogan and Turkey and others, they use these same methods. And, you know, look, it's not happening here because of an authoritarian leader per se, but there are forces in play now in the United States that are not dissimilar and I think are at play in the targeting of me in this particular way, which again is something that I I find to be pretty frightening. So we need help to get through this. And I think we hopefully can get to a better place in our country such that judges aren't able to do this kind of thing anymore. But the struggle continues, as you know, as you know, probably better than anybody. So I I want to make sure that everybody's very clear. You can uh, look at the website, the podcast website will give this information, but also Stephen, again, uh, Chevron, make Chevron clean up. Chevroncleanup.com to sign up for the campaign. Okay. And then donzigerdefense.com. It's all one word, D-O-N-Z-I-G-E-R, defense.com to, to help with the financial side if you can. By the way, if you want to help but can't give money, totally cool. I know we're all going through tough times. Still go to the campaign site and sign up and you'll get in the newsletters and calls to action. But I really appreciate it. I hope everyone will take this very personally because it's just one more situation of if they can do it to anybody, they can do it to you. Um, before I let you go, uh, we do have a mutual friend, uh, Zoe Tryon, and uh, she told me that she's good friends with your wife. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask. I know this must be very, very hard on your wife and your son. You have a 13-year-old son. And how are they doing with all of this? Thank you for asking. I mean, you know, it's it's not easy. I mean, look, I chose to do this work. They didn't. Um, it's different for me than it is for them. I mean, obviously I'm on the front lines being targeted, but they're right by my side and it's hard to watch. Um, however, I think we've done a great job dealing with it. You know, we, I I told my wife from the beginning, because remember this has gone on a lot more than 15 months. I mean, I've been attacked in the press and with their PR campaigns and their demonization campaign for years. And my wife looked at me at the beginning. She goes, do you think you'll ever get your name back? And I said, honestly, no. Um, Well, I said, the best we're going to do in the short term is have a competing narrative. They're going to say one thing about me that's negative, and I will, and others will say, hopefully, the truth, and that'll be positive. And then there'll be these two narratives. But like, I've lost control of my identity. I had to tell my wife that, you know, to some degree, when you become like, I mean, you're a much more well-known than I, but you become yeah, a yeah, public fi- you figure yeah, to some yeah, degree. You become you the wacko crystal lady, right. They it, make up a narrative about who you are. They, yeah, they make up a narrative. You've experienced yeah. this. So, you know, it, it's been it's been not easy, but we, we decided we would never let a trauma turn into a pathology, if you know oh, what I mean. For you, it's Steve, a trauma. But we're like, we're, we're going to keep it out of our home as much as we can. We're going to try to keep our lives as normal. We're going to take our trips to the extent we can and give our kid a normal life. And look, obviously as our son gets older, it's more and more obvious what's happening. And we're just, we're we're together and we're dealing with it and we create happiness every day in this home, which is the important thing, despite what they're throwing at us. Well, I believe, and I ask everybody who's listening to join with me in this thought that Stephen is going to more than get his name back. You are going to prevail. And I know that this is a terribly traumatic, a rolling trauma that has gone on for years. And I, I know that there are so many people listening uh, who join me in uh, truly feeling the heartbreak of this situation, the injustice of this situation, but holding in consciousness that uh, 
as it has been said so many times, the arc of the moral universe uh, is long, but it bends towards justice. And I believe with all my heart that someone who has taken a stand for justice, as you have, uh, Stephen, you will have your day. You will have your day of justice. You will more than get your name back. Uh, there will be a victory of the sort that none of us can even quite imagine. And you will be more than um, thought of as a good guy. You will be remembered for a very long time as a true, truly great American. So thank you very, very much. And, Those are uh, very hope, kind words. Thank, thank you. you so much, Marianne. You're a lovely person and I admire you greatly for what you've done in your life and continue to do. And uh, I, I truly appreciate the support. It means a lot both to me and the people of Ecuador who, who you know, know I'm on this podcast or some of them do. And they understand what's going on in their own way. And, and, you know, ultimately this is about them. You know, it really is. They are attacking me yeah. to attack the people who really held them accountable, the people on the front lines in the rainforest who are protecting our planet and who have been totally abused by Texaco and Chevron. So, you know, attack, an attack on me or any lawyer is an attack on them. And that's really what's happening here. And I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with it to the best of my ability. But your support and the support of people like you means a lot. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much. Everybody, I know that you have heard uh, things in this podcast. Uh, this is a conversation that matters, but I hope that it won't stop here for you. I hope you will go to the website. I hope that you will spread the word. I hope that you will uh, contribute in it whatever way you can, including to the defense fund uh, for Stephen. And uh, don't forget what's happened here. Let's all of us do what we can to make a difference. Thank you so much. God bless you, Stephen. Okay, I have another question here. <clears throat> and this is from Karen. Hi, Marianne. Thank you for your work in the spiritual author realm, as well as running for U.S. president and keeping us engaged in down-ballot progressive elections. Awesome. Cool. I'm a black woman, and what I struggle with is a concern that not you, but many others, are thinking the deep cancer in this country can be resolved with Biden and Kamala winning. I hope and pray they win. With their win, however, the work is not over. The salve is not ready to be placed in this country. We are in deeper turmoil as well as a deeper crisis of consciousness, as you have identified, of morality, of spirit, and of origin story. We cannot move forward until the deep wound of racism is acknowledged in all its truth, until we collectively grieve. Your reparations work and race-based forgiveness ceremonies are so, so important. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Until we collectively acknowledge and admonish this duality of existence we so deeply play within. It's dangerous. It's harmful. And even with a blue Congress, a blue Senate, a blue executive office, the deep wound, which you often address in your book of politics of love and other teachings, must be acknowledged, seen, and healed. There are so many systems built on this racial duality, and it is truly destroying this country and this world. Can white identified people get together, acknowledge their part in this, and be healed so the world may be healed together? I am a victim of child molestation. My family has been destroyed by it because they choose to live in duality instead of processing the pain of the truth, which then allows some aspect of freedom, liberation, right-minded thinking, and clear decision-making because the root has been appropriately dealt with. Our country has never dealt with the root. Until this happens, systems this country creates will have deep difficulty, including this democracy. Black, African diaspora people live with awareness of this duality, with deep, deep awareness of the power of this cancer to destroy and end beautifully intended creations, including this democracy. We each need healing. This country truly needs facilitators to help manage our ability to be with our whole selves as a nation, and that includes our racism and the horrors it daily inflicts upon brothers and sisters, mothers and daughters, neighbors and friends without turning away, without hoping someone else will deal with it, without acknowledging that it is the Buddha, the Christ, the Muslim, the Hebrew, the human in me who must stand up and right the wrongs of this duality, this covertly and overtly racist system, wherever and when Ever it shows up. Amen. Thank you for listening. I don't know if this can be condensed into question or comment, but it aligns with your central teachings and belief, I think. And I hope you can carry the message if you feel guided to, like a bird, so we can all be healed and safe and healthy in this world. Thank you. Many blessings to you and yours. Karen. Oh, Karen, thank you so, so much for that very profound letter. 
And uh, as you know, I have a lot of things to say. Um, when I wrote my, my book, Healing the Soul of America, towards the end of the 1990s, it was in the study of American history that I did in preparation for that book that my own eyes were opened much more than they had been before uh, to the history of race in the United States. And what I have come to believe, and this, this was only confirmed for me uh, in my political run this year, it's not my experience that the average American is a racist, but it is my experience that the average American is deeply undereducated and underinformed about the history of race in the United States. When I would, on my campaign, go into, this would happen with all white audiences in the whitest states. We're talking about places like New Hampshire, places like Iowa. And I would notice that if I would give people a five minute thumbnail sketch, they would start in one place regarding race, regarding racial disparities in criminal, criminal sentencing and, and economics, uh, regarding reparations. And five or 10 minutes later, it's like they're in a completely different place because of how much simply had not been in their consciousness. I would, I would start with 1619, <clears throat> that the first slave ships came over in 1619, that that was followed by almost 250 years of slavery in this country, that it, 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 revved up in the early 1800s with the cotton industry, that when the Civil War was over, that there were, historians believe, between four and five million uh, formerly enslaved people at that time, that they were promised uh, for every former slave family of four, they were promised uh, 40 acres and a mule. In the vast majority of cases, this was not given. Even when it was given, most of the time it was taken back. And except for that 12 years of, of reconstruction where federal troops were placed in the South after the Civil War to ensure that slavery would not be reinstituted as an institution, this was followed by another 100 years of institutionalized violence. We would call it today domestic terrorism against black people in America. Because as soon as the federal troops left throughout the South, the legislatures passed what were called the Black Code Laws. And these Black Code Laws were uh, passed in order to guarantee subpar political and educational and economic opportunity for black people in America. Why do we call it domestic terrorism? What do you call lynching? What do you call KKK? These, these horrible ways that black people um, were treated in the South at that time. So I think that most Americans simply have not taken the time. And in some cases, you know, it's not about judging them. It's the lives they've lived, whatever, to really take into our hearts that we're talking about 350 years of violence perpetrated here. Now, I believe in things like cellular memory. And so, and I also, because my books and my work has had to do with uh, universal spiritual themes, I understand the need for and the power of atonement. Um, Catholics go to confession. Jews, the holiest day of the Jewish New Year is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. People who go to Alcoholics Anonymous know that you have to admit the exact nature of your wrongs, of your character defects, and admit them and make amends. And that is why I started many years ago doing these ritualized apologies throughout, uh, throughout the country in, in my lectures of the ritualized apology of um, uh, be, uh, from white people to black people. And I saw the amazing emotional reactions people would have. And I understand an apology means a lot. It's much easier to forgive people who have had the courtesy to apologize. However, I also came to understand it has to go further than that. You know, when uh, um, Bill Clinton, when President Clinton said that we had to have a national conversation about race, that was very well intended. But I know what happened because I was there. People would come together to have this conversation about race. But it, you're talking about people who have 200 and 300 years of rage to express. And if there are not, as you say, Karen, professional facilitators, either from a clerical perspective or a psychotherapeutic perspective or nonviolent communication perspective, who know how to facilitate 
these kinds of conversations, they don't remain emotionally safe. So the reason that whole phenomenon fell apart was because anybody who tried to get real, anybody who tried to get really authentic with it, there wasn't enough facilitation. And anybody who didn't want to get real and get honest, so if, even those emotional risks, then it wasn't going anywhere either. But I also know this, as much uh, as, as those apologies matter, as that communication matters, I also know this. If you took $1,000 from me, and then you told me you were sorry. I would be very grateful for your apology, but I would still want my $1,000 back. And that's why the amends has to follow the atonement. It's not enough to just say you're sorry. And that's when I began to think so much about reparations and started talking about it and writing about it back in the 1990s. Um, Germany has paid $89 billion in reparations to Jewish organizations. Doesn't mean the Holocaust didn't happen. But it has gone far towards establishing emotional and psychological reconciliation between Germany and the Jews of Europe. And I see reparations uh, the same way. I see reparations as different than race-based policies. Race-based policies such as more money to historically black colleges uh, and so forth, these are important things, money to be invested in in. Uh, uh, minority-owned businesses, et cetera. These are good things. But reparations takes it to a, to a different level because there is an inherent mea culpa. There's an inherent acknowledgement on the part of one people of a wrong that was done to another and the willingness on the part of that people to pay that moral debt and to pay that economic debt. So, Karen, you're absolutely right. This is something that at this point stymies us, both white and black. It's simply an issue of personal growth. You know, all that a nation is, is a group of individuals. So the psychological dynamics that prevail uh, within the journey of one person prevail within the journey of a nation. And you simply can't go forward until you clean up the past. You just can't. I think it was Faulkner's line was, the past isn't over and it's not even past. And if I just, if I just desecrated Faulkner, please forgive me. The point being, however, I'm sure what the point was, was that it still lives within us. So our ancestors live as, as psychological and emotional, and moral and spiritual dynamics within all of us. And this country, it's time. We had the Civil War. We had the Civil Rights Movement. And it's important for us to, to know our history. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act dismantled segregation. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act ensured that there would be a universal accessibility of the ballot. Although in, in 2013, the, um, the Supreme Court started chipping away at it. And God knows we're suffering for all of that now, all these voter suppression efforts, et cetera. If Martin Luther King had not died... You know, you had the Voting Rights Act in 1964, you had the, uh, no, you had the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, and King was killed in 1968. The one big piece that we have simply never taken on. We just, you know, we had the Civil War, we abolished uh, the institution of slavery, there's the issues about the 13th Amendment, but as the institution as we knew it, abolished slavery, then dismantled segregation, gave the universal accessibility of the ballot, and then there's still this gaping wound, gaping issue, ga gaping issue of justice, and that has to do with the economic gap that existed at the end of the Civil War and which has never been closed, and are realizing how much economic policy and social policy and political policy in the United States is the legacy not only of the, the institution of slavery, but also that economic gap. And also, uh, many Americans realize that history does not necessarily go in a straight line. In many ways, we've even taken steps backwards. Mass incarceration is a step backwards. Uh, disparity, racial disparity, and criminal sentencing and so forth is a step backwards. So, Karen, thank you for articulating it the way you did. I agree with you 100%. And, you know, Werner Earhart said you can live your life one of two ways. You can live your life out of uh, circumstances or you can live your life out of a vision. And that vision emerges from a new conversation in our head. Also, it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, your life begins to end on the day you stop talking about things that matter. Race matters. And we are having a new conversation in America. And yes, it's chaotic. And yes, it's difficult. And yes, it's painful. But democracy is messy. 
and stuff has to come up in order to be released. It's a detox process that a culture goes through, just like an individual. It's got to come up. The darkness has got to be brought to the light. So we have great ancestral figures to look to uh, from the Civil War, both black and white. I don't want to just to, to for any of us to forget what other generations before us have done uh, in abolishing slavery and desegregating the American South and so forth. But it's our turn. It's our turn to take the next step. When uh, Richard Nixon was elected president, the same year that Martin Luther King was killed, uh, his domestic advisor, Daniel uh, Patrick Moynihan, said, you know, we've had so much of this drama around race and the war and stuff. And his suggestion to Nixon was that in race relations, their policy should be, quote, unquote, benign neglect. And so while social just justice issues around race were a big deal for a while, a lot of that just stopped in the 70s. And then, of course, we ended up with things like mass incarceration as time unfolded, et cetera. So it's our turn. It's our generation's turn. And Karen, I couldn't agree with you more. And you're right. This isn't going to be fixed just because we elect Biden. Uh, I agree with you. I hope very, very much that Joe Biden wins. I endorse him wholeheartedly. We need Joe Biden to win so that this work can get done. But you're right. It's not like we can just elect Biden and then go home and say, okay, we're fine now. Um, this work must be done. You're articulating it. I'm doing my best to articulate it. Millions of people are articulating it. The conversation is on the table. And uh, I have great confidence that, like other generations before us, uh, we will move it from talk and into action. Thanks so much. 